Joseph Abani is a senior fellow at IPS. He's an independent analyst specializing in Palestinian affairs and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Thank you for watching Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Willie Omens. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Mu'in Rabani about the Arab uprisings and protest movements and how they impact Palestinian politics as well as the Israeli-Arab conflict. Thank you for being on our show, Mu'in. Pleasure to be here. What are the repercussions of these protest movements, of the uprisings, on the Arab-Israeli conflict in general? Well, I think um, the implications have already been very significant and are potentially transformative. I think um, uh, you have to, you can look at it in two aspects. First of all, its direct impact on the Palestinians, and then what you might call its indirect impact on account of uh, changes that are, that are occurring or would occur in the region. If we look at the direct impact um, on the Palestinians, we already see that, for example, the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah has lost its most important sponsor, um, namely the Egyptian uh, regime of, uh, of Hosni Mubarak. And this, in a sense, has removed the Egyptian umbrella um, that has been absolutely vital for the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah to uh, conduct itself the way it has been um, over the past two decades or so, in the sense that um, Egypt has been very keen to regionalize its own relationship uh, with Israel and to kind of draw everyone, uh, all, all the other Arab states, into the types of relationship with, with Israel that we've seen. Second of all, the Egyptian document on, on reconciliation and kind of the Egyptian uh, preconditions for inter-Palestinian uh, reconciliation don't exist anymore. And that potentially has, uh, has a huge uh, impact on the Palestinians. A third issue is that we notice both Palestinian governments, um, Hamas in Gaza and um, Abu Mazen in, uh, in Ramallah, both being quite concerned about facing the kind of uh, rebellions that we've seen in Tunisia, Egypt, and elsewhere. And one thing that they've had in common, in fact, was um, suppressing pro-Egyptian demonstration, demonstrations during, during the uprising um, uh, in Egypt. Um, now, if we look at the regional impact, I think the key issue here has to do with the future of Egyptian Israeli relations. I think it's quite unlikely that Egypt is going to renounce the Camp David Accords, its peace treaty with Israel, or um, you know go to war again with Israel again anytime soon. Nevertheless, I think it's um, quite probable that um, over time Egypt is going to start treating its relationship with Israel very much as a bilateral matter. In other words that um, you know, Netanyahu won't be able to fly off to Sharm el-Sheikh every time he's uh, facing increased hostility to his policy and kind of show that he has an Arab stamp of approval, which then translates into pressure on the Palestinians uh, to go back to the American-sponsored uh, negotiating table and things of that sort. There's a lot of speculation about Netanyahu's diplomatic initiative, which he should be announcing in May in a trip to the United States. Early reports are suggesting that it's a unilateral establishment of a Palestinian state within provisional boundaries, um, and that it should be leading up to a long-term interim agreement. Um, but the details obviously haven't been fully released. Now, would, would you link this kind of initiative to the sea change in Arab politics? Well, I do in the sense that um, while this might have been a somewhat realistic prospect six months ago in the sense that you know, Netanyahu proposes something, Egypt adopts it because the United States supports it, and then a, a, whole, a whole Arab coalition is mobilized to exercise um, pressure on the Palestinians to accept it, that's clearly no longer possible. And therefore, I think this um, latest uh, proposal of, uh, of Netanyahu is very much a stillborn one. It will simply not be possible for the Arab states to respond to American pressure and pressure the Palestinians into um, accepting this absolutely uh, absurd idea of a provisional state or, or a state with uh, temporary borders. But I also think there's another reason that Israel is now proposing this. 
which is um, that there it seems to be increasing international uh, pressure, certainly at the popular level, and I think to some extent even at the governmental level, pressure on Israel on account of its insatiable um, addiction to settlement expansion. We saw this most recently in the UN Security Council, where um, uh, the United States was the only country to vote against a resolution um, uh, declaring the illegality of Israeli settlements in the occupied territories. The U.S. Uh, would have preferred not to veto uh, that resolution, but at the end of the day, since the resolution was tabled, um, the U.S., once again, being more pro-Israel than Israel itself, vetoed this resolution. Now, um, I think Netanyahu is probably intelligent enough to realize that this is something that could change over the next six or 12 months, so has to give the impression um, uh, that he's somehow serious about diplomacy and negotiations and resolving these conflicts and all the rest of it, because at the end of the day, um, negotiations are crucial for Israel, not because Israel is looking um, for a uh, viable or durable resolution of its conflict with the Palestinians, but rather that diplomacy is for Israel um, the essential precondition, or at least has become the essential precondition for continued settlement expansion in the sense that negotiations provide it with the cover and the international support it requires to keep um, expanding settlements in the occupied territories because the, the way that the Americans and the Europeans have typically responded under such circumstances is to say, look, there's a diplomatic process keeping that going is more important than any actual developments that are taking place on the ground. And I think Israel is quite keen to avoid a situation in which, um, you know, governments start saying, well, since there isn't any diplomacy, let's take a closer look at what's actually happening on the ground. You talked about how the role of Egypt vis-a-vis -vis Fatah Hamas might be changing. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, if you, if you look at um, uh, Egypt's position, um, or at least um, the, the position of, of Mubarak and even more so Omar Suleiman, um, the former Egyptian head of intelligence, towards inter-Palestinian reconciliation, their attitude was basically that the purpose of a reconciliation agreement, um, at the end of the day, the purpose of such an agreement would be to get rid of Hamas and to reinstall um, uh, the Abbas-led Palestinian Authority as the sole authority in the Gaza Strip. And the Egyptian um, uh, reconciliation agreement was essentially um, uh, geared towards achieving uh, that purpose. It no longer exists. Um, uh, Egypt, I, I can't imagine how Egypt can now sustain this, uh, this policy with uh, with you know, with Mubarak uh, gone and all the popular pressures it's facing domestically. Second of all, the political process is now dead. Obama's veto in the Security Council was the last nail in the coffin um, to the uh, to the to the, to the di diplomatic process that Obama had been pursuing um, uh, since since he assumed office. So we've already seen Palestinian responses to that. One of these is um, uh, Salam Fayyad's proposal to replace his current government with a national unity government consisting of both um, Hamas and Fatah. And, and there's an important difference between Fayyad's proposal and the Egyptian document in the sense that Fayyad's proposal is basically one government, two authorities. In other words, um, whereas the Egyptian uh, reconciliation proposal was that Fatah returns to the Gaza Strip, but Hamas gets nothing in the West Bank, Fayyad is proposing that Fatah gets nothing in the Gaza Strip as well as Hamas getting nothing in the West Bank, and that you will have these kind of two parallel authorities operating under a single government pending um, uh, elections. Now, whether Fayyad's proposal is, is going to succeed or not is, I think, a, a very, very much an open question, but it already indicates how um, uh, the change of regime in Egypt is having a direct impact on inter-Palestinian politics. What are some of the lessons that Palestinian civil society could take away from the reform movements, the protests in the Arab world? Well, I would say Palestinian society more than Palestinian civil society. 
um, uh, quite clearly, um, uh, you know, societies do have the capacity to have a direct impact um, uh, on their governments and even to throw out their rulers when those rulers are acting in perpetual direct contradiction to the interests of their own people. I think uh, both Palestinian governments, whether in Ramallah or in Gaza City, um, are quite concerned, rightfully in my point of view, that if they continue to place their narrow factional interests very, very high above the national interest, um, uh, that you know this uh, Arab wave could eventually reach um, uh, reach their shores. Uh, secondly, um, another lesson that I think needs to be learned here is that Palestinian leaders, particularly those in Ramallah, have to learn um, that they have a constituency that extends beyond Washington, D.C. In other words, they have to start responding to the needs and demands of their own people and not only of those who are um, uh, paying their salaries. How do you think this changes U.S. foreign policy in the region under an Obama administration? You know, I um, never had any faith uh, in, in Obama or his administration to begin with. And I see absolutely no reason um, to change that assessment now. Just if you, you know, you look at the way he's been um, responding so far to developments uh, in the Arab world, um, I think, you know, the absolute lack of faith is more than justified. What I will say is, is that um, it seems to be a realistic hope um, that on account of these changes uh, that we're seeing, um, uh, the, the Arab states and the Palestinians, whether they want to or not, will be uh, less susceptible to American pressure and demands than they have been in the past, and that can only be a good thing. You know, the history of, of, of what passes for the peace process, um, uh, you know, the, the way the Americans have, as a rule, approached this is to take um, Israeli uh, coalition politics as kind of the outer limits of Palestinian rights. Um, now we have a situation where um, growing numbers of, of Arab states will either refuse to go along with the American agenda, um, uh, or will perhaps want to go along with that agenda, but will not be able to um, uh, because of their own domestic politics. I should add, I think, one impact of these changes is that the Arab Peace Initiative um, is probably, uh, for all intents and purposes, past tense. I don't see how, after um, 10 years of being uh, kicked in the teeth, not only by Israel, but also basically by Wa Washington, which more or less commissioned um, uh, this, uh, this peace, in peace initiative and then uh, did nothing to implement it. I don't see how that initiative can survive these uh, upheavals. As a tentative conclusion, I would say we're now living um, uh, in a new world. Uh, there is the Middle East before uh, Mubarak and the Middle East after Mubarak. I would say that for Palestinians at least, the Middle East after Mubarak promises uh, to be a, a much uh, brighter and, and more optimistic Middle East. Thank you for your time, Owen. We enjoyed having you on Palestine Studies TV. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.